Hello, everyone. Uh, good evening. Uh, good evening to our East Coast uh, participants in tonight's webinar, and good afternoon to everyone on the West Coast. Welcome to our webinar, Understanding Risk Reduction in Treatment Options for Erectile Dysfunction and Other Common Side Effects of Prostate Cancer, which is brought to you by Zero, the End of Prostate Cancer. Uh, my name is Jamie Burks, and I'm the President and CEO at Zero. Thank you all so much uh, for joining us today. We have a record-breaking a uh, number of uh, uh, participants in tonight's webinar, uh, and uh, we'll get to it in just a moment. So before we start, uh, I'd like to go over just a couple of housekeeping items. Uh, first, today's call is being recorded and will also be archived on the Zero website within the week. Uh, so if you miss any part of it, uh, you know, please feel free to go to the Zero website. Uh, but uh, we're also going to um, the Zero website, by the way, zerocancer.org. Uh, you will also receive an email with a link to this recording. Uh, in addition, uh, it is being streamed live right now on Zero's Facebook page. Uh, hello, good evening, everyone on Facebook. Thanks for joining us. Uh, the format of uh, tonight's program will be as follows. Um, after the introductions, I will hand the program over to Dr. Edward Soffin uh, for his presentation on space or hydrogel. When he's finished, we'll take a short period of time uh, to answer questions. Uh, after which, uh, we will then hand it over to Dr. Gary Carlin for his presentation on life after prostate cancer, recovery is a journey. I wanna thank Dr. Soffin and Dr. Carlin for volunteering their time and their energy and their expertise to put into this webinar. Thank you both gentlemen for joining us tonight. And um, for any of you participants that have a question, uh, please type it into the uh, question and answer box. Uh, I see that uh, there's some there's some activity on the chat box, but if you look on the bottom right hand side of your Zoom video, there is a Q and A box. Um, so please put your questions there, and I will be sure to get to them uh, both on uh, space or hydrogel and on uh, being able to cover uh, the side effects talks around life after prostate cancer and recovery is a journey. Um, we have an hour for today's presentation. I imagine that this is a, a very hot topic, so we might uh, run a little bit over, and I hope that's okay with everybody. Um, we're gonna try to end right around 7.30. As I said, we might run a little longer, uh, depending on questions. Um, but in the follow-up email to this webinar, there's, there will also be a short survey. Um, it's really quick to take. It's only a few questions uh, long, and we'd very much appreciate your candid feedback. Um, if you'd fill that out, that helps us be able to make this these webinars even better than uh, before. So your input uh, helps make our programs uh, that much more impactful for patients and families. And lastly, I wanna thank um, our sponsor of tonight's program, Boston Scientific, uh, for their support. Without them, uh, we would not um, be where we are towards saving lives um, from prostate cancer and getting closer to the end of this disease. So with that, I will now turn it over to Dr. Soffin to kick us off. Welcome, Dr. Soffin. Thanks for, for joining us. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Um, there we are. First of all, I want to thank all of you for spending your time on a beautiful afternoon listening to this. Um, before I went to medical school, Many people don't know that I was an unsuccessful actor in New York City. Um, so I find that it's hard for me to get in front of uh, an audience, even a virtual audience, without doing a song or a dance or some kind of uh, monologue. So if you will grant me this opportunity. You, you, you see, this is Jimmy Stewart here. You know, a hundred years ago, we, we had a pandemic. I was a boy of 10 uh, then, and it, it, we just, we didn't, we didn't know if, if we were going to get sick. Uh, we, didn't, we didn't know if we were going to wake up. You, you see, uh, we, we just didn't know. A few years later, my father had prostate cancer. You, you know, back then, we didn't, you didn't even say the word cancer. 
your neighbors were afraid that they were going to catch it. And, and now look, look where you've come. You, you're, you, you've got your coronavirus pandemic, but you, you know so much more about it. And, and you, you know about pr prostate cancer. This is a disease that you, you, we can cure now. And so my advice to you is stay home and watch my movies because it's a wonderful life. Yeah, thank you. That's my Jimmy Stewart. Now, I have a lot to talk about, not a lot of time. Um, every prostate cancer discussion has to talk a little bit about anatomy, some statistics, and then an overview of treatment. But I really want to focus on this fairly new product called Space or Hydrogel. Uh, but I'm going to get to that in just a minute. So in terms of anatomy, I think the important points are, whoop, sorry. Hmm, there we go. The prostate is a small organ. It makes the seminal fluid that men ejaculate, it mixes with the sperm that's made in the testicles and goes up through the vas deferens into the prostate, mixes with the seminal fluid, and then gets ejaculated. The prostate sits just behind and below the bladder and just in front of the rectum. And this will be very important when we talk about risk reduction in terms of toxicities. It's a sobering statistic that one out of nine men will be diagnosed with prostate cancer in their lifetime. This is the most common cancer in men in the United States. Lung cancer is the most common cancer, but lung cancer is almost equally shared by men and women. Prostate cancer obviously is only in men, but it is the second leading cause of cancer death in men just behind lung cancer. So it is not always a sleepy, slow-growing disease. It can be lethal. There are about 165,000 cases each year that are diagnosed and about 30,000 deaths. The good news is the five-year relative survival for early stage localized cancer is greater than 99%, it's 99.2%. The five-year relative survival rate for all stages, that's early and late, is about 99%. And the 10-year survival rate for all stages is 98%. Now, being alive without cancer is better than being alive with cancer. There are lots of side effects and issues that you can have by having metastatic prostate cancer. But still, the 10-year survival is almost 98% for all stages. So it is a very curable cancer in most men. Well, how do we detect prostate cancer? We have to first have some suspicion that prostate cancer is present in a man. Uh, the two most important things that we look at are the PSA, which is pro prostate specific antigen. It is a glycoprotein. It's a protein that's made by normal prostate cells and by abnormal cancer cells. Every man who has a prostate has a PSA value. If cancer is in the gland and as that cancer divides, there will be more cells making this glycoprotein PSA and we'll see the PSA start to rise. I realize many of you already know this, but it it's never, never hurts to get a little review. As the cancer grows, it can coalesce into a nodule, which can often be felt by the urologist or the primary care doctor as a nodule. And so the two ways that we screen people to see whether they're at risk for having prostate cancer is through the blood test, the PSA, and the digital rectal exam. If both of them are normal, the patient probably will not need a biopsy. If one of them is abnormal and the other is normal, then there's a discussion about how likely or not the patient has prostate cancer and may likely go ahead and have a biopsy. If both are present, an abnormal digital rectal exam and an elevated PSA, the man will likely have a biopsy. Now, not every man is going to have to be treated, but we have to diagnose patients to know whether they fall into a risk category that would justify treatment. 
the only way to confirm prostate cancer for the most part is to do a biopsy. Now I have seen men who present with pain, their PSA is in the hundreds or thousands, and we know that they have prostate cancer and on rare occasion we'll forego doing a biopsy because we know they have metastatic cancer and we know how to treat it. But uh, that is a true rarity. There are two ways to biopsy it. Dr. Carlin, if he wants, can go into a little bit more detail. Um, but they both involve putting a needle into the prostate gland to sample the tissue. On the left, you see the transperineal approach. That means a needle goes through the skin, just below the scrotum and just, below, just above the rectum. There's an ultrasound probe in the rectum to direct where the needle is going. Uh, and the other way is a transrectal approach, where the needle and the ultrasound are in the rectum and the needle goes up through the rectal wall into the prostate. That's more commonly used, but sometimes the transperineal approach is used if we have a fusion biopsy uh, or a fusion technique with an MRI that's showing us exactly where we want to go to get the, uh, the high-risk lesion. So once we have diagnosed uh, a man with prostate cancer, we need to decide if he's curable, how curable he is, if he needs to be cured, and then what the best modality is for him. The three important parameters that go into every prostate cancer are the stage, and that's a number that ranges from one to four, depending on how localized it is, whether it has broken out of the prostate but hasn't spread, or whether it has spread. A very important parameter is the Gleason score. Donald Gleason was a pathologist who worked in the VA hospital system. He had thousands of prostates from around the country. All the VA hospitals sent him his prostates, and he came up with a grading system. Uh, it's a way that the pathologist will look at the cells and try to predict behavior based on how the cancer cells look. Now, it's not the be-all, end-all. Some cancers can look very bad and behave well, and other cancers can look nice and behave poorly, just like people can look nice and be very mean, and someone could look mean and be very nice. But it is a good predictor of behavior. Uh, and finally, the PSA blood test. The value of the PSA is a very important prognostic feature in, uh, in developing a protocol for a particular patient. So these three pillars allow us to stratify men into different risk categories for dying of their cancer, either with or without treatment. We categorize men into low risk, intermediate risk, and high risk. We can actually subdivide into very low risk, favorable intermediate, unfavorable intermediate, and high risk. And all of those stratifications may dictate which path a man will go on in terms of his treatment options. Sometimes we'll look at other factors uh, to judge whether or not we have to treat someone or how aggressive their cancer may behave. In other words, their Gleason score may suggest a favorable cancer, but their genomic testing may suggest that it may behave more aggressively than what meets the eye. Um, the genomic testing is basically a fingerprint of every individual man's prostate cancer. They look at the molecular makeup of the genes and they compare that to, the, uh, to a population of men who have a similar genetic fingerprint of cancer and can predict based on how those men did, how that particular man may behave, how his cancer may behave. The three modalities of treatment in a very broad nutshell are surgery, radiation therapy, and active surveillance. Active surveillance is, doesn't mean you go off to an island and you forget about cancer. It means uh, we suspect that this is a low risk, slow growing cancer. Uh, it does require regular follow-ups with the urologist, PSAs every three to four months, sometimes a biopsy every 12 to 18 months. It may require uh, follow-up scans like MRIs with the idea that if the cancer starts to change, if it starts to develop a higher Gleason grade, if more quadrants are involved in the biopsy, if a greater percent of the cores are involved, or if the PSA velocity starts to increase, we may suggest that the man get off active surveillance 
onto an active treatment paradigm. Surgery has been around for many, many years. Uh, it's a radical prostatectomy. Uh, about 15, 20 years ago, the technique was dramatically improved by doing laparoscopic surgery instead of opening up the belly, doing it with a laparoscope, and then adding the robot-assisted da Vinci procedure that has dramatically reduced um, hospital stays, uh, recovery time, uh, continence issues, and, um, and also erectile preservation. Uh, and finally, uh, that which I'm most involved in, which is radiation therapy. I'm probably one of the few radiation oncologists in the world who have treated men with prostate cancer on a cobalt machine that was built in the 1950s, all the way up to and including a proton machine so I've gone from using energies of 1 million electron volts to 300 million electron volts, all in the span of 30 years of treating. So I've seen how prostate cancer treatment has evolved over the years. We've made small increments over time from 3D conformal radiation, where we uh, would design the fields on how to treat the prostate and the computer would tell us what dose the bladder and the rectum were getting, what dose the prostate was getting. Now with intensity modulated radiation therapy, we the physician tell the computer, this is what we want the prostate to get, this is what we will allow the bladder and the rectum to get, and the computer will inversely plan and tell us how to create the specific beam. So it works backwards. There's stereotactic body radiotherapy, uh, you may have heard the term cyber knife, and we can talk about that in a little bit. There's brachytherapy, which is the placement of radioactive material inside the prostate to irradiate the gland from within. That's very attractive for some men who have low risk cancer or men who have high risk cancer in combination with external beam radiation. And finally, there's proton beam irradiation. A proton, unlike an x ray, which goes through the tissue, it goes through one side of the body, through the prostate and out the other side. A proton is a particle, it has a mass and a velocity. It will fire into the prostate and stop. So there is less normal tissue that's getting the entry and exit dose of the x-rays. Now, th so those are the radiation options. Little bit of the overview. So how do x-rays and protons and gamma rays, how do they kill cancer cells? What, we, what we're trying to do is ionize the DNA of cancer cells, make Swiss cheese out of, the, out of the DNA so that the cell cannot divide. And as it tries to divide, it implodes and self-destructs. But we don't want that to happen to the normal tissues. We want to somehow protect them from the radiation. The best way to protect them is to avoid treating them. Obviously, when we treat prostate cancer, we worry about the organs that are right around it. We call those organs at risk, the bladder, the rectum, and the small intestine. Because if we damage those tissues, men can experience urinary dysfunction, urinary frequency, burning, ulcers, bleeding. They can have rectal pain. They can have ulcers, fistula. Uh, uh, rectal incontinence or rectal frequency. If, if this rectum scars down, it's not as compliant. And so uh, men will have more frequent bowel movements and painful bowel movements. So we want to try to minimize any radiation that is getting to those critical organs. <clears throat> I talked a little bit about the different types of external beam radiation. I'm going to talk for a second about stereotactic radiation. For men who have low risk organ-confined disease, we can give the full dose of radiation instead of over nine weeks, or recently we've shown that we can do it in five and a half weeks, sometimes we can concentrate and give a very large amount of radiation over five days. It's very attractive for some men. The beams come in from multiple non-coplanar angles, so each beam is only treating a small amount of normal tissue, but all of the multiple beams add up in the prostate and can obliterate the cancer. And finally, as I mentioned, proton. With regard to the internal radiation, there's the low dose rate implants. Those are permanent little radioactive pellets. And we can also do a temporary implant that gives very 
uh, active, is a very active source of radiation that irradiates the prostate within minutes as opposed to days or weeks. So now I want to focus on this space OAR hydrogel. The OAR stands for organ at risk because we want to space and create some space to help the organ at risk, mostly the rectum. You can see here, I don't know if you can see my pointer, but on the left, we see an axial view of a CAT scan. The prostate is in red, and these different colors represent isodose lines, meaning different dose levels of radiation as the beams come in from multiple angles. Here you see the rectum, and you see a good part of the rectum is getting a very high dose of radiation. There's no way that we can eliminate that. The rectum is literally kissing the back of the prostate. On the right side, we see a sagittal view of a CAT scan. The prostate is in red. Here's the bladder, you can see, and the rectum right here. And the back wall of the bladder and the front wall of the rectum are getting high doses of radiation. This can lead to long-term permanent issues. And the easiest way to treat them is to minimize the risk. Um, I'm going to go into this in a little bit if there's time, skip over. So why should we use this space OAR hydrogel? I want to go back just to tell you about 10 years ago, um, I participated, I was one of 20 uh, researchers who participated in studying this product, the hydrogel. Um, the men were randomized, those who entered the study, some of them got the gel and some of them did not get the gel. They didn't know. They were blinded, meaning they were put to sleep under anesthesia and we opened up an envelope and some of the men got the gel. We put the gel in and some did not get the gel. We didn't put the gel in. And we found in the pivotal study that there was a dramatic reduction in rectal toxicity and rectal dose. And by decreasing the dose to the rectum, that decreased long-term rectal issues. We also found that the space OAR or the hydrogel helped fix the prostate in space so that it didn't move during treatment and it didn't move from one day to the next. Because even though the patient may be perfectly aligned with a coordinate grid system in space, the prostate can move a little bit depending on how much fluid is in the bladder, how much stool is in the rectum. And so the space OAR helps fix the prostate so it doesn't move during treatment. You can see here, there's the prostate. This red zone around it is the high dose radiation. We have to give a margin around the prostate to account for little microscopic cells that may have, been, that may have spread right outside the gland. And you can see that the front wall of the rectum is getting a high dose of radiation. There's no way around it. Now, if we place a gel right between it, it moves the rectum about a centimeter away, which allows the high dose to be absorbed by the gel and it dramatically reduces the rectal toxicity. Now, interestingly, in the study, we found that not only was there rectal preservation of dose, but men who got the gel had a significantly lower risk of bladder toxicity, long-term bladder issues. It's a very complicated mechanism. I don't have time to go into that. But more importantly, or equally important, was the men who got the gel had a significantly higher likelihood of preserving erectile function. And so this gel, this one cc of space, one centimeter of space that we create, not only dramatically reduced rectal complications, but bladder complications and preserved erectile function. So in reviewing these hydrogel factoids, it is a synthetic, biocompatible, non-toxic material. It's placed in one time, it lasts for a full three months, and then over the next several months, it dissolves harmlessly and the body excretes it in the urine. It's mostly made of water with a little polyethylene glycol. And this material is used in artificial tears, other prescription drugs, and some medical implants. I do this in the office. Some people do the procedure in the hospital under general anesthesia. I feel if we do it under local anesthesia, it takes 10 minutes. The man can drive here. He feels a few little pinpricks of lidocaine as I numb up the area. 
I place the gel in, takes about two minutes, and then he walks out and drives home. Uh, the general anesthesia requires a full day of not driving. You need to have someone take you and take you back. Um, it has been proven with indefatigably, incontrovertibly, that it lowers the dose to the rectum. It dramatically reduces long-term rectal issues and preserves erectile function. In fact, the men in the study who did not get the gel had an eight times higher likelihood of having a decline in their bowel, urinary, and sexual function when compared to the men who got the gel. And that study we carried for a median of three years. So this is sort of the take home message concluding side slide. More space, sometimes less is more, but sometimes more is less. More space, fewer complications, fewer urinary issues, fewer sexual complications, and a better quality of life. I know we're talking about how do we you know, uh, improve quality of life after prostate cancer treatment. I wanna not have the patient get to the point where we have to improve their quality of life. We wanna preserve it. And I think this, this hydrogel helped move that needle. I talked about an evolution over 30 years going from 3D conformal to IMRT to brachytherapy to protons. This spacer gel, which I use for virtually everyone, seeds, HDR, uh, temporary implants, IMRT, protons, this reduces long-term issues. We could cure every prostate cancer, every localized prostate cancer by giving as much radiation as we wanted, but we are limited by the bladder and the rectum around us. This allows us to dose escalate, get a higher cure rate by sparing the bladder and the rectum. There have been 75 peer-reviewed articles about this gel. We use it in almost every cancer center now. I've lectured around the country. I've lectured overseas. I've proctored people. It's reimbursed by Medicare, fortunately, and many private insurance companies are recognizing that it's cheaper to pay for the gel than to pay for treating complications later on. And over 50,000 men in the world have had this hydrogel over the last five years. And uh, let me see, maybe we can take some questions. Absolutely, thank you, Dr. Safin. Uh, let me open with uh, this question that we got in just ahead of time, which is, is space or hydrogel covered by Medicare and is it useful for someone who has already undergone treatment? Uh, it is covered by Medicare. We worked very hard at, um, at getting Medicare to approve it, uh, fought long and hard. And as the different systems of Medicare around the country fell uh, and agreed to pay for it, um, I think it's been covered for the last two or two years by Medicare and many private insurance companies. If a man has already been treated and has already had the radiation, there's no point in doing the hydrogel. However, I want to add something very important. Uh, if a man has had external beam radiation and has a recurrence in their prostate cancer, we have a second chance of curing that. We can place radioactive seeds. We can do the brachytherapy as a salvage technique. And in those men, I always put hydrogel because their rectum has already received some dose of radiation. It's going to get a little radiation from the seeds. So we always put the hydrogel in. And that's if a man has a recurrence. But if you've already been treated, um, it, there's no point really in having it placed at this point. Thank you. And um, what is the procedure like to have a uh, hydrogel inserted? Uh, when I do it, uh, the man sits, uh, lies down on the table, his legs go up in dorsal lithotomy. I clean off the perineum. I inject a few little coordinates with lidocaine so that the skin is numb. It takes a few minutes for the skin to, to really get numb. Uh, during that time, I prepare the hydrogel kit. It's like a chemistry set. You have to mix and spin and fill the vials. And then we take a little needle that goes through the skin, which is now numb. We create a space with some saline, and then over 10 seconds, we inject the hydrogel. They feel nothing except the few little pinpricks as I inject a little bit of lidocaine subcutaneously. It takes five minutes, they get up, they drive home. Very, very easy procedure. And are they sore later on that night or the next day or, or no? No. I use a special technique where after we create the space, I inject a little bit of lidocaine into the space before I inject the gel. 
so they don't feel anything and that's about it. Men can feel a little constipated for a couple of days afterwards because the rectum is now being pushed uh, on top by the gel. And so I tell men to take a stool softener for two or three days afterwards until they have normal bowel movements and then they can stop. That's incredible. Now, what, what are the, the, the risks to using space war? Um, there have been a few uh, reported complications from Europe where uh, the needle as it has gone in has gone into the rectum and, and the gel has been injected into the rectum. Um, that's never happened in my practice. If you watch the needle on ultrasound as you're injecting, you just make sure you don't go into the rectum. Uh, I guess theoretically you could have an infection. We've had zero infections, mainly because we're going through the skin. We don't go through the rectum. If the needle goes through the rectum, there's no way to sterilize the rectum. The needle's gonna take bacteria and put it into the prostate. By going through the skin of the perineum, we can clean off the skin with betadine so it's fairly sterile. We use sterile technique, sterile needle, sterile gloves, mask, and um, have no risk of infection. So th there is theoretically the risk of infection, risk of bleeding, but um, just don't see it if the procedure is done correctly. Thank you, Dr. Soffin. Uh, uh, another question that came in. Um, another participant, Stephen, says, uh, I understand that the space or barrier can reduce damage to the rectum. Given the placement of the barrier, it's clear how this is possible. The Boston Scientific website indicates that it helps to reduce damage to the bladder and potential incontinence. Can you explain the science uh, behind this finding? Uh, granted that we, uh, you know, uh, yes, you know, boil it down into a minute, you're right. Um, so when we treat the prostate, the beam has to come in somewhere. It has to come in and we usually arc the beam around the patient. Now, it's either going to go through the rectum, through the sides, or through the bladder. If we have more space posteriorly between the prostate and the rectum, we can bring more of the dose in that way because the rectum's protected. Otherwise, we have to bring more dose in from the front. So by having the space behind the prostate, we can bring more of the dose in posterolaterally, so less has to come in through the bladder. So by creating that space, there's less dose to the rectum, and we don't have to bring as much dose in through the bladder. With regard to erectile dysfunction, we don't know exactly what, what it is, but we think that if gel is injected at, right at the apex of the prostate, it moves the penile bulb a little bit further away from the radiation, or, and or, it may move the erectile nerves out a little bit out of the high dose gradient of the radiation. I know I'm making cups and things with my hands, but it can move the erectile nerves a little bit away, and it can also move the penile bulb further south. And those are the areas that we want to try to really minimize dose of radiation to. Thank you. I can tell by the use of your hands that yes, you are indeed at one point an actor. So I, I appreciate that. Um, just a couple more questions. Could you sh share the research um, behind the gel helping with uh, erectile dysfunction? Well, the research actually came from the pivotal study. Um, so we had a rigorous questionnaire uh, when men were randomized to get the gel or not get the gel. They didn't know, but we went through a, a SHIM score. Uh, which is um, a sort of a rigorous uh, quantitative uh, number uh, that suggests how good the erections are. And then after treatment, we repeated the SHIM score. And the men who got the gel had a higher likelihood of preserving their SHIM score than the men who did not get the gel. So it all that came out of the pivotal paper that was then submitted to the FDA that got approval for the gel. We weren't looking for that. The, the study design was not really looking at erectile dysfunction. It was sort of a side effect that we were pleasantly surprised by. That's great. And can the gel be given after, we talked, you talked a bit about CyberKnife. Can the gel be used um, after CyberKnife radiation to help with erectile dysfunction? It can't uh, be given after the CyberKnife. It really needs to be in place when the radiation is given. And 
I do want to say, and this is just an editorial, if a man is going to get cyber knife, he really should get the hydrogel, the space oil. The rectal complication rate with cyber knife without the gel is like 10 to 12%. That is way high. It means one out of 10 men is going to have rectal complications for the rest of their life. With the gel, we don't know exactly what the number is, but it is dramatically reduced, probably in the order of one to 2% having CyberKnife with the gel. So if you're thinking of stereotactic radiation, that means five treatments, either on a linear accelerator or on a CyberKnife machine, please make sure you get the gel. But after you've had it, there's, again, no point in putting the gel in. It has to be in place when the radiation is being given. Thank you for that. Uh, I'll, I'll ask one more uh, question on Space War, but uh, we are capturing some of these other questions that are coming in and we'll be sure to route them to each of our experts here tonight, but uh, to, to wrap up with one more question. Why can't space ore also be used in the space between the bladder and the prostate? There's no really good way of getting it in there. There's no safe, effective way that we can get it in there. The prostate and the bladder are intimately touching and there's no fascia that we can really dissect away. Um, it would be very nice, but I will say this. The bladder is much more resistant to radiation than the rectum. The same amount of radiation to the rectum will cause damage, the same amount of radiation to the bladder will not. So bladder complications are much less common, although men do experience urinary frequency, rectal, uh, bladder irritation, burning with urination during treatment, but it goes away very quickly. And uh, and the bladder complication rate, the radiation cystitis, if the radiation is done well, should be about 1%. It's very hard to lower 1% by gel. Um, so, but that's it. Thank you, Dr. Soffin. Thanks for, for sharing your expertise and spending your time with us this evening. And uh, like I said to all of our participants, I know there's more questions coming in and we'll be sure to, to route them to uh, Dr. Soffin to get them uh, answered for you and uh, included in our, our uh, email materials. Um, so th thank you again. At, at this point, I'd like to turn things over to Dr. Carlin with his presentation on life after prostate cancer, recovery is a journey. Thanks for joining us tonight, Dr. Carlin. Pleasure. So uh, tonight, I want to take you through some of the uh, aspects of life after prostate cancer, what you can expect at times, and what you can do to alter any kind of uh, side effects or complications with the help of both the radiation oncologists, such as Dr. Safin, and the urologist participating. And any questions, feel free to uh, put them in the question and answer. I'll be happy to answer them at the end. Okay. So prostate cancer, um, unfortunately, is the most common non-skin cancer in America. It affects about 10% of men. Um, and that, when you look at those numbers, there's really 3 million men in the United States that are prostate cancer survivors, a large, large number of men. The common side effects of treatment can include, two most common can be bladder complications, which can include anywhere from burning with urination, blood with urination, frequency or urgency, and also, of course, bladder leakage. Uh, and the other one is erectile dysfunction, which unfortunately can occur both with the surgical uh, treatment and with radiation treatment of the prostate. And I'm going to be talking about ways to uh, to deal with these complications or side effects as we go forward. So let's first start with uh, bladder leakage or as we would call it, bladder incontinence. So bladder leakage um, is basically any form of urinary leakage from the penis that can occur throughout the day. Um, people can have small amounts of leakage which can occur with coughing or sneezing that we call stress incontinence, that occurs from any increase in pressure that would occur due to uh, sneezing, coughing, lifting. 
And then there is what we call urgency leakage, which is a leakage that occurs because someone feels they have to rush to the bathroom, and that often has to deal with bladder dysfunction. And then lastly, there's just passive incontinence where a person says, hey, you know, I'm just leaking without any provocation and the, the urine's coming out and it's making my lifestyle uh, very uncomfortable for me. Uh, when you talk about treatments, there is always an evolution, certainly with surgery, which we'll get into in a few minutes. Um, leakage can improve as one gets further from the surgical uh, recovery and one can gain better and better control within that first year of recovery. So there is always optimism as time goes on from the original surgery. So we talk about robotic prostatectomy, and one of the things that I want to make sure people understand is that just because we're using a robot doesn't mean that you know the surgeon is taking a coffee break. Uh, the surgeon is working the robot, and it is surgery. You know, people think because machines get involved that all of a sudden this is not a serious surgery. This is a sizable surgery that uh, requires great skill to make sure we reduce complications. But you can see that even with the robot, that about 10% of men will still have some form of incontinence. And again, sometimes it's just with a cough or a sneeze, but other times it can be quite bothersome. And that's when the patient's going to come to the urologist to say, okay, doc, what can you do for me? How can you improve my quality of life? So the patient who says to me, listen, doc, you know, once in a while I have a couple of drops if I sneeze and I sneeze only once a week. Well, that patient quite often is not terribly bothered. They can often get by with pads, um, maybe a, a very thin pad. It may be damp at the end of the day, it may only be stained, and that lifestyle may be perfectly adequate for that patient. But when the leakage gets much more involved, um, then it really impairs quality of life because then you're talking about using diapers, you're talking about penile clamps, which are quite uncomfortable when placed on the penis. Um, so these things are, are certainly ways to improve, but they do not necessarily improve the quality of life as much as the patient wishes. Now, when you get to the more moderate bladder leakage, uh, when you start having a patient say, you know, I'm wet during the day, I'm wearing one or two pads a day or more, uh, and uh, I am limiting my activity because I am uh, uncomfortable, you're really talking about two procedures that are used in this uh, country to try to cure the patient of their incontinence. The first one is called the male sling, and that basically what it is is a mesh, a very safe mesh, unlike the meshes that we may have seen on the TV about all the worries about uh, complications. This mesh has been proven to be exceedingly safe. And what it is is that it's a mesh that's placed through a small incision underneath the scrotum to compress the urinary tube. So if the urinary tube is more narrow, then what we would expect is a continent person or a person who does not long, no longer leaks with coughing, sneezing, or worse, no longer leaks with that passive leakage, as we call it. This surgery takes about an hour. Uh, there's one small incision pretty much underneath the scrotum. It's an outpatient procedure, and the Wonderful part of it is that you can take a patient from their, them being incontinent to continent and have an immediate result when they leave the hospital. And this is for patients with mild to moderate leakage. This is also for patients that have had no radiation therapy. This is purely a procedure primarily for patients who have had robotic prostatectomies and find six months or later down the line, they are still leaking. Now, for patients that have more um, moderate to severe leakage, going through three, four, five pads a day, and they are wet, and, and or they've had radiation therapy, the, the sling will not do a good enough job. 
So these patients undergo what's called an artificial urinary sphincter. Now, the reason it's called that is because in surgery, one of the damages that occurs is the sphincter in the penis. That's what helps us stay continent or dry. That's the sort of the muscle that prevents leakage for all of us, all male and female patients, but we are at this time talking male. So what this cuff does through, again, a small incision underneath the scrotum as an outpatient, outpatient surgery, is it wraps a new cuff around the urethra, the urinary tube. So that cuff stays closed. If it's closed, you're not going to leak. Now you may say, well, how do I go to the bathroom then? Well, as you can see on this diagram, there's a small little pump in the scrotum next to the testicle. And that pump, if you press it, the cuff opens. The cuff opens and you have a normal desire to urinate. You urinate as you were prior to surgery. And then within a minute or so, the cuff closes. So you're continent again. Now, the hardware that you're looking at, none of that is visible. None of that is felt by the patient internally. It's all there to act as a open and closed mechanism that has been damaged during the surgery. The good news is that, again, outpatient surgery, very high success rate, and the patient uh, satisfaction is exceedingly high because we're taking people from leakage to continents and really changing their lives. Now, how do we determine you know, who we're gonna do what to? Again, it all comes down to the amount of leakage, it comes down to talking to your patients, seeing what kind of lifestyle they live, seeing what they require as, as far as being dry, and making sure, obviously, they're good surgical candidates that we can give them a good prognosis at the end of the day. Now, again, you can see in front of us, there are some websites you can go to. Certainly, you can speak to your local urologist um, and, and find out more. Um, and through Boston Scientific, you can find out a, a lot more about these procedures. So the big issue is how bad is the incontinence that guides the selection of the procedure. Okay, at this time, I'm gonna jump to uh, sexual health and uh, obviously we call that erectile dysfunction. And we're gonna talk about what can the urologist do with the patient that says, you know, I've had radiation therapy or I've had surgery and now I can't get hard enough during intimacy. I can't maintain my erections during intimacy. Doc, what are you gonna do for me? How can I get back into a more healthy relationship with my partner? So prostate cancer, unfortunately, for multiple reasons, either through surgery or radiation, can cause problems with erections. It can cause problems with the blood flow to the penis, which is what an erection is. An erection is the increased blood flow during stimulation. It could cause effects on the nerves that are on the prostate that can be affected both by radiation therapy or by surgery. And so it is not unusual for the patient in the immediate post-radiation or post-surgery to have to start to regain their sexual function. And this takes time. No one is going to go from problem to perfect cure within a short period of time. It takes time to get that function back. So we don't rush it. We enhance it. We try to encourage it with penile rehabilitation. We give medications early. We give injectable therapies early. We're trying to get better blood flow into the penis early on so that the tissue can maintain its health and revigorate. So that's very important, and the urologist will be intimately involved with the patient. So what we want to talk about now is what are those options? You know, what are the options for the couple? So here are, here are some of the options available to uh, any individual coming into the urologist's office post-surgery or post-radiation therapy with some problems with the erection that want better function. As we all know, Viagra and Cialis have been around for several years now. What those drugs do is they increase blood flow to the penis. They are quite effective. They work in over 50% of patients. Um, they do have some side effects, but they are well tolerated and they are not dangerous drugs. 
Some side effects could be in small numbers, headache, upset stomach, flushing of the face. But clearly, it's very easy to determine the effects of these medications because either they work or they don't. There's no reason to be on these drugs for several weeks and months at a time if they work. That's terrific. If they're not working, then certainly we are not as encouraged. These medications are typically taken about a half an hour before stimulation. And with stimulation, they create an erection. That is your own natural erection because, as I said, they're increasing blood flow. The vacuum pumps are, again, a second mechanism of increasing blood flow. They are cylinders that are placed over the penis, and they correct, cre create a suction on the penis to create rigidity. After the rigidity is obtained, it usually takes a few minutes, and it certainly creates uh, an erection not like the normal erection, but it is adequate. A constriction band is placed on the base of the penis to make sure the blood stays put in the penis so that the erection is of some reasonable quality. Um, the constriction band um, is sometimes a little bit uncomfortable, and certainly one can't keep that constriction band on for more than potentially 20 minutes to a half an hour. But it is of help in terms of improving blood flow to a patient if they so wish to go via that route. The other route to take, as you can see in this diagram, is injection therapy. It's a very popular treatment in this country. Again, as you can see, the patient is self-injecting a medication at the base of the penis. What that does is the medication goes right to the source. The medication dilates or opens up the blood vessel, and all of a sudden we get this major rush of blood into the penis, and an erection occurs within 10 minutes with stimulation. It is extremely successful. There are no significant side effects. And one of the big bonuses of this medication is that it's very inexpensive and very, as I already mentioned, very safe. It is an excellent way to go to try to restore function early on. It's very helpful to restore function and can be used long-term in patients who may need some help as they move forward in life. The other approach is taking that injectable medication and placing a pellet inside the opening of the penis. That is uh, called Muse, M-U-S-E. Uh, my experience with Muse, which has not really been used very well in this country, is that the effects are minimal. So I have not really encouraged people to go that route because I have not seen any great results with Muse. And finally, one of the most successful treatments we have in this country with the highest patient satisfaction rate is the implants. The implants are creating an inflatable and deflatable erection, just like normal. What I mean by just like normal is the rigidity is the best you're going to obtain in any of these treatments. It gives you excellent rigidity for intercourse. The sensation and orgasm are the same as, as you remember prior to surgery or prior to radiation therapy. It is completely concealed. No one can tell you have a device in place. The way the penis gets rigid is by using a pump. The pump, as you can see in the scrotum, as indicated here, is pumped about eight times. And what it does is it transfers water into these cylinders. The cylinders, if you felt them outside the body, feel like the tip of a glove. You cannot feel them internally, but when that water gets transferred into the cylinders, you get a rock hard erection that can stay hard as long as you want. The pleasure is the same, the orgasm is the same. All it's doing is giving you that rigidity for a period of time so you can enjoy your intimacy. The beauty of this procedure is it is outpatient. It is covered by insurance, which is uh, a big bonus, and uh, it still has the highest satisfaction rate of all treatments uh, for erectile dysfunction. It has been around for many decades. It keeps improving as the devices get more and more sophisticated. So again, um, as I hope I've been of some help, um, the, there is no reason to live with urinary incontinence and erectile dysfunction. Unfortunately, these are side effects and complications that can occur from both radiation and surgery, but there's no reason at all to have a decreased quality of life, certainly either consultation with the radiation oncologist and the urologist 
is certainly available, and you can see, I hope by tonight's review, that these treatments are readily available and can truly improve your quality of life. Uh, let's go over some things with uh, some of these questions you see in front of us, and if you have any others, feel free to ask. Um, the stress incontinence, as I mentioned, um, is with coughing, sneezing, laughing, and lifting. And you'll see that um, that's very, very common in the first three to six months of patients recovering from surgical intervention. But by the end of a year, you're having about a 10% rate of stress incontinence. And that can vary from a person who has to give a very hearty cough to somebody that can just move in a certain way and leakage can occur. Um, why don't all men recover erectile function? Because unfortunately, most of the men who are treated for prostate cancer already have risk factors, such as their underlying age. Uh, they may smoke. They may have other diseases, such as diabetes, high blood pressure. All of this is already affecting the quality of the erection in many men. And then you add insult to that, which can be either the radiation affecting the nerves or the blood flow, and the same with surgery. So unfortunately, it's, uh, uh, it's one problem added on to another. And uh, unfortunately, if you look at by one year, about 30% of men, if not more, still are having significant problems with erectile dysfunction. And are penile implants covered by insurance? I would say 90% plus of insurance plans are covering implants and are also covering the slings and the sphincters. So I have not really run into any significant numbers of patients that are being denied. These are just some of the patients that we have seen and some of their uh, favorable changes of lifestyle. And uh, certainly you can see these on the websites. There are plenty of uh, testimonials about improving quality of life after treatment for prostate cancer. These are some of the organizations that are out there to help all of us educate. And I think they're invaluable because of this day and age of the internet, uh, the information is uh, extensive. And certainly it doesn't hurt to come into the doctor's office with some education already because you can be a better consumer the more you know. So just to summarize again, Erectile dysfunction is a common problem after any treatment for prostate cancer. It doesn't have to be permanent. There are solutions, and the solutions are quite effective. Um, we go from one treatment to another if, solutions, if the treatments aren't working. As you can see, we can go from one treatment to another to try to get that patient into a, a long-term uh, solution that works for them. As far as the urinary control is concerned, um, if it requires surgery, the good news is the surgery is exceedingly high success rates. The patients recover quickly, and the, the, the change in their lifestyle is dramatic because these patients are often not venturing out. Um, they're worried about the odor. They're worried about the cost of buying pads, and this changes their lives dramatically. So I would say the next step is make sure that you talk to your partner you know, try to, try to stay motivated, try to stay optimistic, and of course, speak to a doctor who takes interest in your quality of life and will offer you the full spectrum of treatment alternatives so you can improve your quality of life. Questions? Thank you, Dr. Carlin. We do have uh, questions, uh, but, but thank you for your wonderful presentation. Uh, for, first off, um, we have a question coming in. Um, how can adjuvant uh, ADT with radiation affect risk of erectile dysfunction and options for restoring function? Well, unfortunately, when you add ADT, and for the rest of our, our audience, ADT is using hormone therapy for patients with prostate cancer, typically can be used in patients who have a little bit more aggressive prostate cancer and undergoing radiation therapy. Unfortunately, um, hormone therapy does increase the rate of erectile dysfunction uh, in patients as they move forward. It may be due to, again, some of the effects of hormone deprivation on a patient's uh, system internally. It may be due to their changing their libido or their desire. Um, it does have some long-term effects. 
when that does occur, those patients can be put into the same category of treatments as any other patient. So they, they don't have to worry that they have to be put into certain specific treatments. If the ADT is long-term, it's a little bit more difficult to get results uh, in certain patients. If the ADT is short-term, they have a higher chance of recovering their erectile dysfunction. But regardless, they are still, whatever category, they're put into the same treatment options as everybody else. Thank you, Dr. Carlin. Um, we, another uh, participant writes in, what are your thoughts on the use of uh, ultrasound shockwave therapy for erectile dysfunction? Um, this person says it appears to be expensive and not covered by health insurance. And how long does the positive effect uh, last of doing so? Yeah, I, I would caution patients to enter into any treatment uh, that is not FDA approved. Um, if you look at the data from what we call shockwave lithotripsy of the penis, which is basically sending pressure waves against the penis to create better blood flow to the penis, we're presently undergoing investigation with, these, uh, with this technology. So really to get yourself into a treatment modality that we do not know what the appropriate number of shocks are to administer. We don't know the long-term effects at this present time. We do not have concrete data concerning success rates, and uh, it is very expensive. So I have not been one to encourage patients to enter into treatments that are not FDA approved unless they are in a clinical trial. And if you go into our AUA site, you will see that same recommendation is not to engage in these non-FDA treatments that are not proven yet to be uh, definitive treatments for erectile dysfunction. Well said, thank you, Dr. Carlin. Uh, what are um, what ED options work if the if uh, the the nerves that are needed to achieve um, an erection are, are are cut? The the best treatments uh, for those patients are going to either be the injectable treatment or the penile prosthesis. Quite often when you have nerve damage um, that can occur either with radiation or surgery, uh, the oral medications, the Viagra and Cialis are much less successful. The vacuum devices are much more difficult to uh, gain an adequate erection. So you're looking more likely at either A, the penile injection therapy and or the implant. Um, those are the two most commonly used treatments in this day and age. And are those in injections painful? Or how, how long, about how long do they last? The injection therapy, if they're working properly, once you inject, and I'll get to the pain in one second, um, they, they, with stimulation, an erection should come on within 10 to 15 minutes and will last in, in an appropriate patient about a half an hour or will last until ejaculation or orgasm. Um, as far as the pain is concerned, it's very variable. I think this relates a lot to the anxiety of doing an injection. Most of the patients that we inject in the office, which is the initial orientation, we try to show patients what it's all about. We don't just say, here, take the syringe and do this. Obviously, they're taught how to do it. We take them through this process and we show them the result in the office. Most of the patients will say it's a minimal pinch. Uh, the patients that say it can be a little bit worse are probably patients that have a little bit more anxiety, which I can certainly appreciate, but it's a very minimal procedure for most patients. And patients, believe it or not, can be doing these treatments of injection therapy way into their late 80s. Thank you. And um, do you recommend using a, a vacuum pump every day indefinitely and, and uh, for, for how much time per day? Well, the vacuum pumps are, are used for what we call penile rehabilitation. So the two main uh, avenues for rehabilitation is either the oral medications, if you're feeling there is positive results, or the vacuum, res vacuum uh, device. And that would be used at least three to five times a week. You can use the vacuum for 10 to 15 minutes at a time. You don't necessarily have to put the constriction band on. We're just trying to bring more blood into the penis to try to prevent scarring of the internal penis. Uh, we wanna create better blood flow and better health to the tissue. But again, these require very motivated patients and patients that are certainly 
have some support from the urologist or the radiation oncologist. Uh, thank, thank you, Dr. Carlin. Is there any time limit on receiving an implant, um, like age, time since prostatectomy or, or other treatment? Yeah, none, none whatsoever. There are no restrictions to the implant. The implant is, uh, again, has the highest success rate, highest uh, satisfaction rate. There's no such thing as a patient that's too old. Uh, if you're still having intimacy and you still have a partner uh, that is interested, um, it is an excellent way to go. So we do not limit it by age. Certainly there are certain patients that could be very unhealthy. That may not be the best selection of a patient, but in the vast majority of patients, there would be no restrictions or contraindications to an implant. And certainly there is no such thing as time since treatment that you would be eliminated. It does not make a difference how long ago your treatment was. Thank you, doctor. Uh, I understand that there's no cookie cutter treatments when it comes to prostate cancer or its side effects, but uh, uh, nevertheless, I'll ask this question anyway that comes in is uh, a participant writes in that he had a radical prostatectomy and then has been on Lupron for about the last two years. Um, how long can he expect uh, to wait before he can achieve an erection? I'm sorry, Jay, did you say he had a radical prostatectomy? Yes, had a radical prostatectomy and then had been on Lupron subsequently for two years after. Um, I, I honestly would tell that patient, and I'm not trying to be discouraging, by, but, but if you have not had adequate erectile function by year one and creeping into year two, uh, the chances of getting an adequate erection with, without any assistance is very uh, limited. Okay, thank, thank you for that, uh, that clarity. And um, let's see, we'll, we'll, we'll do uh, one more question. Uh, I know we have more questions coming in. And as I said before, we will route these to our experts to um, answer your questions uh, after. Um, but let's, let's wrap up with um, uh, participant rights and occasionally during uh, orgasm, I notice a, a yellow oily discharge. Um, what is this and should I be concerned? Um, because most orgasms, as I understand it, are dry. Yeah, so let's talk about that. Um, when you have orgasm after uh, surgical intervention uh, and there's some discharge, that can come from some of the urethral glands that are in the penis, can create a little bit of uh, excretion or discharge, which is completely harmless. Some patients, unfortunately, could have a tiny bit of urinary leakage when they orgasm. Again, urine is sterile, so although it does not sound pleasant, it really has no issues with infection. Um, so the bottom line is that is completely harmless. Uh, probably the worst issue is uh, the, the anxiety it can create by not knowing that it was harmless and that in terms of, you know, what is this? Is this a terrible infection or so forth? No, it typically is a, a benign situation. Thank you for answering that. I uh, also want to remind everybody, all of our participants, uh, that uh, you can go to spaceor.com for more information, uh, edcure.org, and or fixincontinence.com. Um, and before we end the session, I want to highlight some of Zero's patient program uh, uh, highlights before, before we uh, close up. And all of these programs are uh, available at, uh, at, at no charge uh, at all. Uh, first up is our program that's called Zero 360. It's a comprehensive uh, patient support program uh, in which we, um, we focus on being able to relieve financial stressors uh, when it comes to men and families who are fighting prostate cancer. And it, uh, it's, as I said, it's all comprehensive and free and is able uh, we, we enable to help patients uh, solve problems like um, uh, getting insurance companies to cover uh, treatments, um, getting, in, getting insurance companies that uh, had originally rejected coverage of treatments to overturn that to be able to uh, recoup funds uh, at, that you have paid out of pocket for treatment, uh, talking with um, your mortgage company if you're struggling to um, you know, pay your mortgage, especially at this time of um, high unemployment and, uh, and economic stress as, as, as a result of, uh, of COVID. 
and, and uh, being able to search through uh, clinical trials and, and uh, being able to determine which one might be the, the best for you. So that is uh, all free and available on our website at zerocancer.org. We also have a free um, uh, testing um, um, uh, site um, within, our, within our website uh, to be able to get uh, a free or low cost uh, uh, prostate cancer testing uh, at a uh, uh, location near you. Uh, it's a map that you can you can search through and put in put in where you live, and it will give you the closest locations where you can get a free or low cost test. We also have uh, Zero Mentor Program, um, which is really exciting and interesting, and doesn't really exist anywhere else. We pair up men who are newly diagnosed or new patients to Zero with uh, with mentors, with uh, with survivors and patients who have been down been through their cancer journey. Uh, to link you up as a new patient or a new patient to, to us here at Zero, to be able to share um, your experience, to be able to uh, learn more about uh, what you might expect, because we pair you up with a mentor who has had some similar experiences to what uh, you may be going through. So, so the, the two of you can can uh, be able to connect and, and, and share on those experiences and be able to get an understanding of what, uh, what may be coming your way in your cancer journey. We also have uh, our Zero, Zero Caregiver Connector, uh, which is a brand new program that we just launched within the last couple of months. So just as I said about our mentor program, um, the same is true for our caregivers. Where would we be without um, our caregivers in our cancer journey? And they need love and they need support too. And uh, we have a one-on-one -on -one support program for uh, caregiver mentors. If you're a new caregiver uh, or a new caregiver to zero, we have um, a whole co cohort, a whole, whole team of um, caregiver mentors that we can match you up on based off of your concerns or your questions that uh, you might want to get answered um, as part of uh, creating a relationship with a, with a caregiver mentor. Again, all free and available through our website at zerocancer.org. And we also have Zero Connect which is a uh, closed and private Facebook group. Uh, and that's aimed for cancer patients, survivors, caregivers, family members, loved ones, friends, um, supporters, uh, et cetera, to come together to share their experience, strength and hope around their prostate cancer journey and to ask questions and to share stories and connect with one another. I want to uh, thank, uh, yes, if you would like to contact me, uh, again, my name is Jamie Burst and I'm the president and CEO at Zero the End of Prostate Cancer. Uh, and uh, you can follow me on Twitter uh, to get all the latest news and information about prostate cancer at Jamie Burst uh, on Twitter, or you could also, and I should say, you should also follow us at Zero the End of Prostate Cancer. We're at Zero Cancer on Twitter or find us on the website at zerocancer.org. Um, I'd like to thank, um, give my deepest gratitude to both Dr. Soffin and Dr. Carlin for giving their time and energy tonight and lending your expertise around uh, these very important topics uh, around being able to have uh, safe and effective radiation treatments and then being able to uh, achieve sexual function uh, after prostate cancer and being able to have a uh, a healthy and full life after treatment. And finally, I'd also like to thank our sponsor, Boston Scientific and Space Or, Space or uh, for a great presentation. And lastly, thank you to everyone on the webinar tonight for joining us. As a reminder, you'll receive an email with a link to uh, this recording uh, so you can watch it again. Or if you missed any part of it, you can cover that section again. But it, uh, in that email, you will get a short survey that we will ask you to um, fill out so we can continue to make uh, our webinars that we bring to you um, better and better all the time. Again, thank you for joining us tonight. Um, the webinar will be saved on our website at zerocancer.org. And uh, thank you all again for joining us and have a good evening.